Thanks, Paul and Elena, for this wonderful foundation uh, for me. Uh, it covered everything which we need to know in treating children with cancer with regards to nutrition. Uh, but most of the audience who are actually pediatric oncologists would agree with me that in today's world, uh, our aim is just not cure. We are looking at cure with least long-term effects and highest quality of life. And in this regard, we need to be aware of uh, the long-term morbidity and mortality these children endure after treatment. Specifically, we are going to focus today on nutrition, morbidity, and mortality, which is a huge burden these survivors face. A lot uh, of that has been briefly touched by Elena and Paul in their discussion on BMI in leukemia survivors and in terms of micronutrient intake. So we're going to brush through them, but we'll focus on other aspects uh, in detail. So in today's uh, discussion, we're going to focus on the burden of challenges survivors face with regards to nutrition. What are the predictors of higher BMI and undernutrition in survivors? What is the need and impact of nutritional interventions? What is the dietary intake in survivors? Do they follow the dietary guidelines, what is recommended for them? And like, lastly, what guidelines exist which we can use in our practice? This slide shows the progress we have made in the last 30 years in treating childhood cancer. We have made a huge impact, and now we are treating more than 80% children who are coming to our clinics. And if you look at the Russian burden, uh, there are more than 5,000 children in Russia which are being diagnosed every year. And looking at a conservative estimate of 70%, you have a huge number of survivors, at least 3,500 coming to your clinics every year for follow-up with long-term complications. What is the burden of survivors uh, in, in, the, in the world today? There is no real estimate on how many survivors we have. Uh, there is this number which was published in 2005, 10 years ago, in a very uh, uh, prominent epidemiology journal from US, indicating that there were roughly 325,000 uh, survivors at that point in time, looking at conservative estimates of 25% cure rates. And in next decade, I'm sure this number has crossed uh, 400,000. This is just in US. So we can imagine that US treats only 10% of pediatric cancers all over the world. So we're looking at at least 10 times the number of survivors. And in Russia, I'm sure the number is almost same, if not more. So what is the cost of cure in these survivors? Uh, this seminal study published in NEGM in 2006, which is uh, part of one of the most famous studies called Childhood Cancer Survivor Study, which followed more than 10,000 survivors uh, from 1970s in US, and this cohort was, is being followed continuously. And what they have found at the end of 30 years of follow-up, two-thirds of survivors would have at least one long-term side effect. And one third of them would have severe or life-threatening side effects. And nutritional morbidities cover this entire spectrum, and I'll focus on them one by one. So among the nutritional morbidities, the, there are six common ones which we see in this family, in children. Uh, they have BMI changes, which Elena talked about. They have both the risk of obesity and uh, undernutrition in survivorship, like they have during treatment. Even if they are having normal BMI, they have altered body composition, and I'll talk about that, especially focusing on sarcopenic obesity. They have growth hormone deficiency causing growth retardation. They have osteoporosis, vitamin and mineral deficiency, and most importantly, they have a metabolic syndrome, which puts them at risk of long-term mortality. Very briefly, touching on the, the, the alterations of bony metabolism in these children, it is multifactorial, seen in more than a third of survivors Typically, in leukemia survivors who have received long-term steroids or methotrexate, which causes decreased bone mineral accretion. Also, in the past, most leukemia re uh, survivors received radiation, and which causes uh, de decreased growth hormone and as well as causes decreased bone, uh, peak bone mass. In transplant survivors, if they have even acute or chronic GVHT, especially with chronic GVHT, they have significant loss of bone mineral density. So these survivors have pre-existing loss of uh, bone mineral density because of altered bone metabolism. And in addition, many of these survivors have deficiency of vitamin D and other nutritional deficiency, putting them at risk of long-term uh, skeletal morbidity. This is modifiable because by uh, t uh, following up these survivors with DEXA scans and monitoring their intake, this could be prevented. Coming next to the most common challenges of uh, 
nutrition mobility in the survivors is the altered body mass index. Uh, again, data from childhood cancer survival study, uh, which looked at the body mass index in entire spectrum of pediatric cancers. What clearly came out was looking at there was gender difference in how the BMI changes post-treatment. When you first look at females uh, and you compare them with the general population, the females with ALI, acute lymphoblastic leukemia and brain tumors typically have higher BMI than the general population. While the, the girls with lymphomas and abdominal tumors or amputees typically have lower BMI compared to general population. And I'll come to the reasons later. When you look at boys, uh, that impact of increased uh, BMI in brain tumors and leukemia is less prominent. It's not significantly higher than general population but they're at much higher risk of lower BMI. And this happens typically in three groups, uh, which is sarcomas, lymphomas, and abdominal tumors. And this is because they get a lot of exposure to alkylators, anthracyclines, and radiation to abdomen or other parts of the body, putting them at risk of lower BMI. Now, this lower BMI does lead, like higher BMI, to long-term complications, and they have more morbidity and mortality in long-term. While higher BMI, although higher in, uh, more commonly seen in girls, but also seen in boys who have received more than 20 years of radiation, seen in acute lymphoblastic leukemia and brain tumors. How common is the issue of BMI alteration in the survivors? So we looked at our uh, survivors, more than 1,600 survivors in our clinic, out of which uh, 450 we just recently published. Uh, in our setup, surprisingly, we had around one-fourth of survivors having moderate or severe undernutrition, while the prevalence of obesity or overnutrition was 15%. Now, this seems to be different uh, from the published data from the West and higher-income countries, where, of course, I'm sure Russia would fall in the same group, that uh, the obesity prevalence is much higher in Canada, US, and in Saudi Arabia, which is published, uh, which is a third of them become obese or overweight, vis-a-vis -vis in India, which is 10%, while overweight is far more, it's double of what you see in the Western countries. So there is an impact of the background prevalence of undernutrition and overnutrition in the population on how survivors are going to do in long term. Of course, in general, the underweight prevalence comes down during treatment, so they tend to accrue or increase their BMI during treatment. So while the prevalence of undernutrition in Indian population is around 42%, this comes down to 26% post-treatment while the obesity prevalence is just 6% in doubles during treatment. Coming to uh, obesity and sarcopenic obesity, especially in the ALL, which is the most common uh, group of survivors and where it is very important to be aware because this is where you see the most common uh, increased BMI changes which Arena talked about. How common is it, when does it happen, and why it happens to understand whether we can intervene and prevent that from happening. So this study, again, from Childhood Cancer Survivor Study, compared all the survivors who were followed uh, from the time of their diagnosis in 19, early 90s to uh, 2000s. Over 10 years, there was almost doubling of obesity prevalence in the survivors. Visibly, if you compare with the siblings, there was only uh, roughly 10% increase in the siblings. So there was a definite increase in obesity prevalence uh, with treatment in survivors compared to their siblings. And this was confirmed in this large meta-analysis of more than uh, around 2,000 survivors uh, published recently in pediatrics, where all the 20 studies showed that there's an increased BMI in survivors. And if you look at overall uh, prevalence, BMI is roughly around 80th percentile in survivors. Uh, in some studies, it's even more than 95%. So there is confirmation from large uh, studies and meta-analysis that BMI increases post-treatment in ALL survivors. But there is a subset of patients who don't have increased BMI. And the question is, are they healthy? And the answer is no. Man, many of the survivors who have normal BMI have altered body composition. And this is based on the recent studies which looked at patients, who, survivors who had normal BMI compared to the male normative values. And when they underwent DEXA scans to look at their body composition, they had higher fat mass and lower uh, lean mass compared to their uh, male normative values or siblings. So this confirmed that although survivors may be normal uh, based on BMI, but if 
we look for visceral obesity or central obesity or use DEXA scans, they're likely to have altered body composition and this is where the, the high prevalence of sarcopenic obesity comes in apparently normal survivors. And hence our conventional tools of measuring obesity based on BMI is not appropriate in survivors. They should undergo uh, measures of central obesity by using waist circumference or by using DEXA scans. When do survivors gain weight? And there is a window of uh, intervention in the survivors. So if you look at the, the time from the diagnosis of ALL patients, uh, it's very end of induction after exposure to steroids that they tend, on, they tend to increase the BMI and that increase in BMI stays throughout the treatment and post-treatment. So actually the window of intervention has to start uh, is during the first month of treatment and has to start very early and not wait for the BMI to increase because it's very difficult to shed weight once the survivors gain weight. So Elena talked about this, what are the reasons for increased BMI? Uh, again, back to the childhood cancer survivor study, uh, they found that, uh, of course, the certain disease subgroups were at high risk of increased BMI, which was acute lymphoblastic leukemia, the brain tumors, exposure to radiation. But what also turned out was there were psychosocial factors. And survivors who had come from the lower socioeconomic strata, uh, typically the ones who were inactive in, the, uh, in, uh, in general, and who were from uh, black race were more likely to have increased chance of uh, increased PMI. If you put that all together uh, and look at uh, the, the etiology of obesity in survivors, mechanistically it is because of three broad groups. Uh, first and foremost is radiation exposure. Radiation exposure in uh, children with ALL puts them at risk of leptin resistance. And leptin is an important uh, cytokine which is uh, important for the energy metabolism as well as for appetite uh, suppression at the hypothalamic level. Second and uh, the most important of course is among drugs, steroid exposure. Steroids typically put the survivors at risk of early weight gain and decreased lean mass causing sarcopenic obesity. And lastly, of course, there is growth hormone deficiency because of radiotherapy, which is an important uh, hormone for fat cell differentiation and expansion apart from resistance levels. So uh, uh, due to radiation and chemotherapy, there is already a uh, pre-existing uh, milieu of increased BMI. And in addition, there are psychosocial factors, which is increased energy intake and decreased activity and less expenditure, which puts them at risk of increased BMI. So what are the implications of increased BMI once we all acknowledge that there is increased BMI in survivors? Uh, obesity and increased BMI puts the survivors at risk of insulin resistance. And that, of course, leads to metabolic syndrome. This is very, of course, known to everybody. But what is the prevalence of those meta cardiometabolic risk factors? If you look at uh, dyslipidemia, survivors have 16% higher chance of being dyslipidemic, 42% higher chance of being obese, 9% higher risk of hypertension and 42% higher risk of diabetes compared to the unexposed population. Second challenge survivors would face where obesity contributes indirectly, not directly, which Elena talked about is the risk of second cancers. There is roughly 9% risk of uh, second malignant neoplasm and among them breast cancer is among the most common uh, at 30 years of follow-up, which is much higher than the general population. Of course, they have risk of other known melanoma skin cancers as well. Now, obesity is a known risk factor for development of second cancers, and it may contribute or add to the already existing risk the survivors face of second cancers. So, we all know, and Elena pointed out, that nutrition is a modifiable risk factor during treatment. But the question is, is it, is it modifiable risk factor for these long-term complications uh, in survivors? And the answer is yes. Uh, this study, Elena quoted, is one of the most uh, powerful epidemiology study which showed that if you look at the proportion of cancer deaths attributed to different factors, diet comes top. Uh, roughly uh, one third of all uh, cancer deaths can be attributed to bad diet. And whether diet can be modified and modification in diet and activity can, can that prevent long-term risk of sec second cancers. So this last study, which was published recently in uh, American Journal of Can Clinical Nutrition, followed more than uh, 500,000 participants for more than uh, 20 years. And this study looked at the ones 
the, the, the general population uh, recipients who followed the American Cancer Society guidelines for good diet or healthy diet, which we're going to talk about later, it reduced the cancer incidence by 10 to 20 percent, cancer death by 25 percent, and overall death by around a third, which is a huge impact of diet on development of long-term uh, complications, especially second cancers. Also, diet has been shown in general population and in survivors to impact the metabolic parameters, development of metabolic syndrome, and cardiovascular complications. This is one of the uh, recent landmark studies published uh, from US, where they correlated the Mediterranean diet score in the survivors in, in three groups, uh, between up to three, four to five, and six to seven. And they found that for each point increase in the Mediterranean diet score, the risk of uh, in BMI, the higher waist circumference, which basically indicates sarcopenic obesity, uh, the, uh, the, the dyslipidemia, the hypertension, and uh, the activity, there was reduction in metabolic risk factors by almost a third by, for each point increase in Mediterranean diet. So it clearly showed that if the right diet is given to uh, the childhood cancer survivors, especially the leukemia survivors, it can impact the long-term cardiovascular morbidity and mortality. But question is, do survivors follow guidelines? <clears throat> there are many guidelines which exist, and Zelina talked about that, uh, that there is a uh, systematic review of multiple studies looking at the compliance of diet uh, uh, in survivors. And the gist is that most of them, uh, less than half of the survivors, meet the recommended guidelines for the diet which is recommended. They have low intake of even micronutrients, and typically these are females and adolescents and survivors of central nervous system tumors which are at high risk of being non-compliant with the diet. So there's a clear need for dietary guidelines uh, as well as ensuring their compliance in the survivor population. So what guidelines exist which we need to know, which we can uh, sort of use in our clinics to guide survivors? There are many long-term survivorship guidelines from different countries. We have the American COG guidelines, we have the UK guidelines, the Dutch guidelines, and Scottish guidelines. Uh, and all of them have some aspect of nutritional counseling. But the most uh, relevant for guiding survivors are basically three groups of guidelines. I mean, they're very similar, though, is American Institute of Cancer Research guidelines for cancer survivors, which are very relevant. Uh, there are guidelines from American Cancer Society, which are actually most followed uh, all across. And typically, they focus on maintaining a healthy weight uh, in regular physical activity and, of course, the diet, which I'm going to detail in my next uh, slide. The dietary guidelines are most detailed by the COG in the recent uh, 2003 update. And the gist of those guidelines are that survivors should stick to healthy diet, which should include fruits and vegetables for more than five servings a day, if they take juice, it should be a limited amount, more less than four ounces, and should be pure fruit juice and not with any added sugars. They should, have, of course, have high fiber diet. They should have low fat dairy products. And of course, they should avoid the bad diet, which includes, I think all of us know that, it's fried and high fat junk food, refined carbohydrates, which includes all kinds of sugars and juices, uh, red meat, which Paul talked about in his discussion, alcohol limited to, you know, two glasses a day, and then, of course, all these processed foods. At the end, I would like to thank my uh, Russian colleagues for their warm hospitality for us, and even for our survivors, these are our survivors who come here uh, to Russia every year, and they are hosted very warmly, and they have left a lot of huge impact on the survivors who come here every year for these world children winners games, and they come back empowered and happy. Игрок, они the тоже принимали своеобразное участие. Much. Спасибо вам большое за внимание. Being aware of the current uh, controversy in adding micronutrients during the treatment of ALN, what is the current recommendation to give zinc during a diary of a child with ALL on chemotherapy and adding vitamin D, who is not having uh, any feature of rickets, yet the vitamin D level is low? Okay, so this question is for Paul about uh, the role of zinc and vitamin D uh, supplementation in uh, children with cancer. Sorry, sorry, Brishish, can you just... Uh, so it's basically the role of zinc and vitamin D supplementation uh, for children with cancer. Uh, may I ask the attendee to... Is it, is it the question you asked, right? Okay. So zinc and vitamin D. <clears throat> 
Well, physiologically, zinc uh, has a lot to do with the lymphocyte proliferation and, and the development of T and B cells. Um, and it has well been shown that those that are zinc depleted have more respiratory infections and those that have chronic diarrhea from rotavirus, etc., uh, are frequently zinc depleted and that chronic diarrhea can be improved by zinc supplementation. So one of the hypotheses that we had is that because uh, oncology patients uh, on the chemotherapy do appear to become um, zinc depleted, although no, with no clinical manifestations, maybe we could decrease the risk um, of uh, upper respiratory viral infections, respiratory infections, and some of the patients who get uh, diarrhea by supplementing uh, zinc to those patients with ALL in a randomized controlled double-blinded fashion. We weren't able to do that. The reason we weren't able to do that is because there is theoretical evidence that by giving zinc, you may help promote blast proliferation. And so that is the interaction um, um, and dynamic problem. The only way we can resolve doing those sort of questions and answering the question, does zinc help or does zinc um, cause harm, is with embedding those kind of trials into a classical um, phase three randomized control trial. Does that answer your question? Okay, he also wants to know about vitamin D supplementation because it's quite prevalent in majority of Asia and you know, Europe as well. Uh, but question is correcting it, is it, is it acceptable is, or is it harmful? I think that's the question he has. Vitamin D, vitamin D deficiency, yeah. Um, vitamin D is also controversial. Um, part of the problem with vitamin D is that few people recognize that uh, high dose vitamin D in actual fact has harmful effects as, as well. But um, again, the evidence of using it as a supplementation during treatment is just not there. But uh, there have been numerous um, studies showing um, in both low-income and high-income countries, and especially those that come from cold countries like I do in Canada, uh, that uh, in Scotland they did a study on ALL patients and they showed that 80% of the patients uh, on starting ALL treatment were below the recommended levels for uh, vitamin D. I personally supplement when they're low, but am I doing harm? I can't tell you that, but I think I am doing some good. Um, I can just add on to that, that the um, protocol at my institution, as well as several others throughout the US, is to test for vitamin D status, uh, which is by 25-hydroxy, um, not 125-hydroxy. And um, if they're low, we supplement, um, at least until they get to a normal range. Vitamin D is one of those nutrients that it's um, kind of easy. Uh, we have a very sensitive marker versus all of the others. Um, it's more difficult to get a, a good indication of status. Um, but we have a very sensitive marker for vitamin D. So if they're low, so below 20, we would supplement. Um, the amount we supplement with is dependent upon how low the uh, serum values are. Any more questions? So if there are none, uh, I just have two announcements on behalf of the organizers. The first is that in the next session we have some Russian colleagues speaking in Russian and there would be translations on that. So I would request you to pick up the, the headphones with the translators from the outside uh, so that all the speakers who don't understand Russian can understand uh, the translation. And second, the coffee break uh, is only for 15 minutes so that we can catch up and we can start on time. So thank you very much and look forward to joining you back. <laughs>